your Bibles, would you please, to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, probably one of the most familiar resurrection day passages. Stand at the reading of God's holy word. Early in the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was left behind, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips um, of linen laying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself and separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So what does it mean that he saw and believed? He saw and believed Jesus was risen? Well, no, it just said they didn't understand. They saw and believed what Mary said. They took the, they took the body of Jesus away. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who's it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, must have wore blue jeans, right? No, I'm sorry. Not in the text, I'm sorry. Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I'll get him. Jesus said to her, Mary? She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet turned to return to my father. That doesn't mean that, that he was not physical. What he's saying is, in the Greek, don't keep holding on to me like you're not going to let me go. Like we would if we saw Jesus that morning, right? Okay. Don't hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Father, thank you for your holy word. Thank you, Lord, that your word is true, and we love you, and we bless you. Thank you, Jesus, that just as Mary received a third day faith, our days today, Lord, those who don't believe at all that Jesus, you will speak into their hearts and they'll receive it. And those of us who are struggling in areas of unbelief, hallelujah, there's a third day faith for us as well. Lord, and I just ask that you will just move by your word and by your spirit and you do this right now. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Turn around and say to one another, you could have that third day faith. Amen. So we come to Jesus' first resurrection encounter that he will have, one of many that he'll have with his followers. And it was between him and Mary Magdalene. Uh, Mark tells us that Mary, of whom Jesus cast seven devils out. Um, here we discover, I, I don't know if you picked this up when we were reading the text, but Jesus was met with heartbroken unbelief. He was. 
But his third day resurrection is going to turn into her third day transformation. Where an unbelieving heart changes into a vibrant heart of living faith. Um, you know, we mistakenly think that unbelief is more of a choice of our will and an issue with our thinking process. And though there can be no doubt that one's unbelief affects his thinking and his decisions, the reality is, did you know unbelief is an issue of our fallen nature? It's a spiritual issue. And it's beyond our own personal ability to re remedy. Our text is going to demonstrate that because unbelief is a condition of our fallen nature that we, we, we cannot outwill our unbelief. We cannot outthink our unbelief. We cannot even out experience our unbelief. But it's only through the living Savior who died and rose again can he remove that unbelief and he can actually give us a heart of real faith. And that's the issue, brothers and sisters. Too long we think that faith and belief that the Bible talks about is something in our minds. There is no doubt that our faith is a reasonable faith. But understand this. The mind of faith doesn't save. It's only what Jesus brings in our heart. For the Word of God says, doesn't it? In Romans 10, 9, doesn't it, doesn't it tell us? Unless you can confess Christ as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's a heart issue. And belief always was. Let's, let's go through this a little bit. And let's, let's, let me just kind of demonstrate what I mean about unbelief and what I mean about Jesus changes our un unbelief into a vibrant living faith. Read the first verse with me again, would you please? Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now we know from Mark's account, if you want to keep your finger here in John and kind of look over at Mark 16, 1, that Mary was not by herself. John focuses only on Mary, but Mary wasn't by herself. Mary was with the other Mary. She was with um, Salome. She was with some of the other ladies. And they went there to complete what was undone in the preparation of Jesus' body. But the fact that they went there early on Sunday morning to complete what was left undone to prepare his dead body was a sign of unbelief. Remember reading in your Bible when Peter made the great confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God? You can read all about it in Matthew 16. It says, this has not been revealed to you by flesh and blood, but rather this has come by revelation from my Father. And then the Bible says, from that time on, Jesus began giving them the details, not only of his suffering, of his death, and then literally physically of his resurrection. From that time on, he didn't just kind of mentioned it once he didn't mention it twice as a matter of fact the gospels record Jesus told him over and over and over again he even told them the day before he was to be crucified he told them the week before he told them that month before they had all the right information these women who took care of Jesus and took care of the disciples they had all the right information but they still were gripped by unbelief. Brothers and sisters, you could have all the right information in the world and it's not going to change your unbelief. Unbelief is a spiritual problem. It's not a thinking problem. But we make the mistake, don't we? 
We make the mistake of thinking, if I could just argue them into it again, if I could just say it to them again, if they'll just get it in their thick skull again, maybe they'll believe. Uh uh, it's a spiritual problem. You could, you could talk, talk to them until you're blue in the face. It ain't going to change until Jesus does something in them. That's why the Bible says, in, for instance, in Romans chapter 1, where it talks about God in his creation. Did you know God in everything he has made has revealed his beautiful, total, perfect existence? Did you know he has done that? Amen. And so it says, so men are without an apology. Men are without a defense before God. But then it says, but they suppress the truth with their unrighteousness. Um, what does that mean? Any of you ever been swimming in a swimming pool and there was a big ball in there? And you push the ball down? What happens if you let it go? Whoa. Okay. That ball naturally wants to come up. The truth of God is out there always coming up. But the Bible says we suppress it with our unbelief. We're constantly holding it out. There's something about our sin nature that just doesn't want to believe, refuses to believe. And the problem is, is right information won't change that. Helps, but won't change it. We go on. Look at verse 2. Let's read it. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they put him. So we read that and we say to ourselves, well, this is understandable. She's grief-stricken. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. There is something that happened in between verse 1 and verse 2 of John. And, and Mark chapter 16, verses 5 through 7, tells us what happened. This is, this is crazy. So she just thinks they've taken him out of the tomb, right? That's what she's saying here, right? But look what she experienced before she ran to tell Peter and John this. It says in Mark chapter 16, beginning with verse, verse 5, as they entered the tomb, this is the women, this is Mary Magdalene, as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they, they get this, she has this angelic visitation. And he, this angel said, he's risen. He's risen, just like he told you he was. But what does Mary say? Where'd they take him? They robbed him. You know, it's amazing that even supernatural experiences cannot change unbelief. How rare are angelic encounters in the Bible? Rare. Look what happened just a couple hours later. Look, look, look and it's not going to be on the screen. In verses 11, so, you know, Peter comes running. John comes running in there. John outruns him. Peter goes in first. They're just there. They're all just wondering, what in the world? And then it says in, in verse 11, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb. And now she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. That sounds stubborn to me. Doesn't it to you? And I don't know where they've put him. Two angelic encounters within a couple of hours. That's very rare. But here's the point. Even supernatural experiences 
cannot change unbelief. We pray, oh Lord, if they would just see a miracle, they would believe. Oh God, if you would just do something mighty, they would believe. And the reason why God doesn't answer those prayers is because he knows unbelief is not an issue of them seeing something supernatural. Unbelief is a disposition. It's a spiritual problem. It's a problem of our fallen nature. Amen. Amen. So, then verse 14. Read it with me, would you? At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. Okay, so now she's in Jesus' very presence. She's hearing him because he's going to say, why are you crying? And she's thinking, he's the gardener. She's hearing him with her own ears. She's looking at him with her own eyes. She's got to believe, right? The problem with unbelief is that it's a heart condition that influences what we see, what we think, what we hear. It does. She could not process and accept that this was the real living Jesus. Her unbelief made her rationalize that this was the gardener who took Jesus away. Even hearing, even seeing, didn't change unbelief. When I was a kid, I kept praying, God, show me Jesus, and I'll believe. I never could figure out why he didn't do that. But I really wanted to see Jesus. Was I the only one who ever prayed that? Blasphemy, y'all. No. I did. It wasn't until the real Jesus encountered me in a real way. And the real Jesus did something and gave me that heart of faith that I understood. If I saw the real Jesus, I would have rationalized it away anyway. And demanding to see him one day, the next day, I'd still not believe. Because unbelief is beyond my ability to change me. It's a heart condition. It's a condition of our spirit. It really is. So, look what Jesus does. Now, this is, this is just crazy. This is wild. Verse 16. So, she, she thought he was a gardener, that whole thing. Why are you crying? Read it with me. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Now, some will argue that she finally recognized Jesus' voice, and that's why she believed. But listen, if that were so, she would have already recognized it when he said, why are you crying? It was more than merely speaking her name that changed her heart. By God's great grace, Jesus spoke this time in a way that broke through to her spirit. He spoke this way and it miraculously broke through all that hurt, all that anger, all that despair, all that fear, all that unbelief. And his day of resurrection, he was instilling in her a vibrant living faith. It wasn't just saying Mary, I'll tell you why I know this. Because look what the Bible says concerning how faith comes. Read it with me, would you please? Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word rhema of Christ. Now what I'm speaking to you, what you're listening to me is what's called logos. In the New Testament, when you read the word word, it's either logos or rhema. What you're reading in your notes, what you're reading in your Bible is logos. Rhema is God's word spoken to your spirit. 
Now he could use the Bible, and he does sometimes. He could use a sermon, and he does sometimes. He could use a testimony, and he does sometimes. He could use a song, and he does sometimes. I'll never forget, it was about 15 years ago, on this Resurrection Sunday morning, a lady grew up in church. She was a wonderful lady, had a passel of kids. Her and her husband are believers. They grew up in church. They brought their kids to church. They would, they would volunteer. They would do ministry as a whole family. It was wonderful. But one day, that one Sunday morning on Resurrection Sunday, she was sitting there listening to the sermon, listening to the graphics, listening to the Word of God. And all of a sudden, she turns around and looks to her brother and she says, wait, wait a minute. This Jesus really is alive. What happened? What happened was, she moved from traditional thinking Christianity to a believing faith that Jesus instilled in her heart. And only the Lord can do that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rhema word. God speaking. God making it alive. For just as Jesus was dead, his physical body was dead in that tomb, so is our spirit before we get saved, and so is our belief system before we get saved, until God resurrects it. Amen. Hallelujah. And he does. And he does. See, Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And he speaks to us. Now listen, listen. This is what Peter meant. There was all these Christians. We're now on the way in the, uh, over halfway through the book of Acts. And all these Jewish Christians were persecuted. And they lost homes. And they lost family members. And they lost their jobs. And, the, and they were kicked out of Jerusalem. And Peter's congregation was now spread all over the world. And Peter was writing this letter to encourage them. And look what Peter says about their faith because Jesus birthed it in them. It wasn't just this Sunday school kind of faith. It was supernatural because you just know you don't understand it, but it's just there and it's just happened. Read it with me. Read it. Peter, Peter's talking to them. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. That's the Jesus kind of stuff he puts inside of us. But brothers and sisters, let me, let me ask you something. Okay, those of you who are born again, you, the reason why is because it's God's grace who made alive in your very heart that word of faith. You could not believe on your own if it wasn't for God's grace. Amen. And he did that in you. Something in you goes, I just know he does. He's alive. He, he's alive. He is the Lord. The word of God is true. That comes from God. But how many of you know we still carry over into our Christian life unbelief? Or am I the only one? And there's areas of our Christian life. Oh, there's the, 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 the important stuff, I mean, we grabbed a hold of. But for whatever reason, there's areas where we're just having a struggle with unbelief. So how does that change? How does that change? Well, if I couldn't initiate faith in the first place, and if Jesus is the author and the perfecter of my faith, completer of my faith, I, I, I can't fix my unbelief. Oh, I could sit there and try to memorize the Bible all day long, but that will not change an area of unbelief in my life. Two years ago, I could not believe. I prayed, I repented, I talked to the Lord about the condition of my body, and I could not believe that it can change for the better anymore. I'm serious. Oh, I repented. And I was trying to do all the right things, but I, in fact, I just, I, I just, what I was, 
not down one too many. Come on, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Maybe not about my body, but have you been knocked down in one area, knocked down in another area, one too many times, and you're just almost even afraid to even try to believe? And so, subtly, this unbelief is just there, and I just can't. Some of us have that towards unsaved loved ones kids who have become prodigals. Some of us have that towards your own life changing. In fact, unbelief about our own life is the hardest one. God, I'll never get free from this. Lord, I'll never be transformed. Lord, I'll never change. You all know what I'm talking about? Well, how does that change the very same way that Jesus changed Mary Magdalene on that third day? Brothers and sisters, there's third day faith for you as well in the area of your unbelief. Amen. Hallelujah. But Jesus must speak it. The Lord must do it. So what do we do? One of the greatest Faith requests in the New Testament wasn't from the centurion and it wasn't from the Syrophoenician woman. It was from the dad who had a little boy who was demon possessed and it would act out in epileptic seizures. It was not epilepsy, it was a demon, but it would throw him into the fire throw him into the rage. You were trying to destroy him. The, the dad asked the disciples if they could deal with it, and they couldn't deal with it. Finally, Jesus came. There was this big commotion, a big fight with the disciples and religious people. Why couldn't you do it? Why couldn't you do it? You know, that kind of thing. Jesus was going on. And the father said, I brought him to you. And if you, if you could, could you free my son? And Jesus said, if? All things are possible to them who believe. And this is what the Father said. This is great faith. I believe. Help my unbelief. Well, how's that great faith? He's acknowledging his unbelief. Great faith doesn't lie about its condition. Number one. Number two, great faith understands its condition is beyond itself to fix itself. It needs Jesus to do it. I believe that, Lord, in this area, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. And that's all Jesus needed. And rebuked that demon. The kid fell down, looked like he was dead. Jesus walked over there picked him up, and he was delivered. I think sometimes what we need to do, brothers and sisters, is instead of keep trying harder with the areas of unbelief, just acknowledge you can't fix it. Just be real about it. And just go to the one who puts the faith in us anyway. For the best we can do is feed our brains, but it will never get in our heart unless Jesus does it. Is there an area of unbelief in your life? You want to say, Jesus, I believe, but would you, would you help my unbelief? You watch him resurrect. You watch him come through. You watch that area where you have given up hope and all of a sudden you're going, you know, Jesus, you could do this. All of a sudden, Jesus, I'm just going to obey this. You know, all of a sudden, a verse of scripture or a song or he just, he'll use something and that rhema will come in and it will just free you from that grip of unbelief and fear. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Hallelujah. It's a done deal. You all know what I'm talking about? Would you kind of like to pray that prayer right now? Why don't you bow your heads, would you please? How many of you right now is a just 
you, you, you don't know Jesus as your Savior. And something happened in these songs and these verses and that you're going, you know, I don't know why, but in my heart, Jesus is really alive, just like my friend did 15 years ago. And I want him to be my Lord and Savior today. How many of you here can say that's you? I'm not going to embarrass you, but I need to acknowledge that. Raise your hand. Just put it up and down so I know. Okay, good, good. Two, three, four. Okay, good, good. Then just pray that. Say, Jesus, only you can birth the faith in me that's required to be saved. And so I know I'm a sinner. Just say that. And I come to you now. And Lord, I just know something inside of me is happening. And it's not me doing it, and it's not the service that did it. It's you doing it. And Jesus, from this day forward, I put my faith in you. Forgive me for all my sins. I turn from them now with your help. And I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. In fact, let's all just say it out loud. Jesus is Lord. Knowing you are risen from the dead. Okay. That took care of those of you now, for us, who are believers that struggle with unbelief in areas of our life. Who, as you're bowing your heads, will just, as a point of confession, confess your faults one to another, pray for one another, well, just raise your hands, put it up and down, saying, I do have an issue of unbelief right now that I need the Lord to touch me with. Okay. All over, all over this room. That's probably why the Lord had me do this, or this message this week. Let's just be like that dad. Let's just be genuine with them, shall we? Just be real. Say, Father, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe. Help my unbelief when it comes to my kid. I believe. Help my unbelief when it comes to my own condition, my own heart, my own problems and habits. I believe. Help my unbelief, Lord, when it comes to just, to, to just this financial struggle I'm in. I believe. Help my unbelief where it comes to this marriage. I've just given up. It's dead. I believe. I believe, but help my unbelief. And Lord, I just invite you to speak a word to them now and resurrect, break that un the chain of unbelief in that area. And Lord, let faith arise in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Because we believe, we obey. We don't obey first to believe. We believe because Jesus put it in us. And those, there are those here today because of their faith in a living Jesus. They want to just go public with their love and their commitment to the Lord. And um, they're going to be baptized. So I want to invite those of you, Chris, could you come and help, that are going to be baptized, if you would just please come on up.